Ladies and gentlemen, yes, um, this is the judgment of the court, which is delivered pursuant through to Rule 23 .1 of the Supreme Court Presidential Election Petition Rules uh, 2017 in the presidential election held on the 9th August 2022. This is an abridged version of the judgment. The full judgment will be delivered after 21 days. Kenya is a sovereign multi-party democratic state whose foundations are firmly spelled in the Constitution. The Kenyan people's quest for electoral reforms since independence is well documented. That notwithstanding, and even without going back to the pre-1992 era, Every cycle of elections has been highly contested, with the exception of 2002. This speaks to a background of distrust of the administration of our electoral process. Informed by this setting, Kenyans made a decision to vest the Supreme Court with the jurisdiction to determine questions regarding the validity of a presidential election under Article 140 of the Constitution. The reactions following the declaration of results of the presidential election of 9th August 2022 shows that the Independent Electoral and Boundaries Commission, IMBC, has not yet garnered universal public confidence and trust in the internal management of the commission and directions. On the 15th August 2022, six days after the general elections were held, Mr. Wafura Chapkati, the chairperson of IMBC, announced the following results. Raira Odinga, 6.942, 930 votes, representing 48, 0.85%. William Ruto, 7.176,141 votes, representing 50.49%. David Wahiga, 31,987, representing 0.23%. George Wajakoya, 61,969, representing 0.44%. Based on their foreseen results, the chairperson of IMBC declared William Samoy Ruto, the first respondent, the presidential candidate for the United Democratic Alliance Party as the president-elect. This declaration has precipitated a total of nine presidential petitions that are filed before us to wit number one, presidential election number 001 of 2022, John Joroge Kamau versus Wafura Chapkati and three others, and Raira Amoro Ondinga and seven others named as interested parties. The second petition is presidential election number 002 of 2022, Youth Advocacy Africa and another versus IMBC and 12 others. Third petition, presidential election petition number 003 of 2022, Kerif Karifa and three others versus IMBC and three others. Fourth petition, presidential election petition number four of 2022, David Kariukingari versus IMBC and nine others. Five, presidential election petition number five of 2022, Raira Amoro Odinga and another versus IMBC. 
six, presidential election petition number six of 2022 by Moses Kuria and others versus Honorable Raira Amoro Ondinga and four others named as interested parties. Number seven, presidential election number 007 of 2022, Okia Omtata Okoiti and others versus IMBC and others. Number eight, petition number 008 of 2022, Juria Nyokabi Chege and others versus IMBC and three others. And the last one but not least, petition number 009 of 2022, Ruben Kigame Richete versus IMBC and others. In addition to these petitions, we received a total of 24 interlocutory applications and one preliminary objection, which were filed in this court. Two of the presidential election petitions were struck out. That is petition number 6006 and 009 of 2022 for failure to meet the constitutional threshold as set out under Article 140 of the Constitution. On 29th August 2022, this court also admitted three Amici Curie briefs by the Royal Society of Kenya, the Kenya Section of International Commission of Jurists, and John Warubengo and two others. Upon perusing and considering the issues raised in the remaining presidential election petition numbers, 001, 002, 003, 004, 005, 007, and 8, the responses and the submissions filed thereto, this court found that all the seven petitions substantially raised similar issues and sought similar reliefs. Consequently, on 30th August 2022, this court ordered that the seven petitions be consolidated and designated presidential election petition number 005 of 2022 as the read file. From the consolidated petition, the responses filed and submissions uh, filed by all the parties, the court crystallized the following issues for determination. And those issues are there. We have repeated them several times. I will not read them. Having considered and deliberated upon the consolidated petition, the attendant responses, submissions, and also considering the Amici Curie briefs, we now make the following determination on issue number one, which is whether the technology deployed by IBC for the conduct of the 2022 general elections met the standards of integrity, verifiability, security, and transparency to, to guarantee accurate and verifiable results. As noted in the introduction, lack of trust in the electoral system has endured in Kenya for a long time. This led to the introduction of electoral technology following recommendations made by the Independent Review Commission on the general elections held on the 27th December 2007 popularly known as the Krigler Commission Report. That report recommended integration of technology into Kenya's electoral process for registration, identification of voters, and transmission of results. These were enacted in Section 44 of the Elections Act 2011. By this statute, IMBC is enjoined to adopt technology in the electoral process. 
As a consequence, the IMBC developed a technology known as Kenya Integrated Electro Management System, KIMS, making Kenya's election process an hybrid as it employed both technology and manual processes. The first, third, and fourth petitioners in the consolidated petition challenge the technology used by IMBC during the 2022 general election. They print that the manner in which technology was deployed and utilized fell short of the prescribed constitutional and statutory standards. As regards the audit of the register of voters, they urge that IMBC, pursuant to its elections operations plan, committed itself to conducting an audit of the register of voters by 31st March 2022. To the contrary, they arrange it only publicly availed the audit report on its website on 2nd August 2022, which was only seven days to the elections. In this, in this report, it was noted that the auditors established serious gaps and risk to the electoral process, including numerous cases of change of voter stations without knowledge or approval of the affected voters. Grant of voter update privileges in IMBC, IDMs, to 14 user accounts and related to voter registration. Reducing the accountability of user activities in the register of voters presence of 11 active generic accounts on the MBIS application and the two MBIS users with the same logging identification. Risking unauthorized system users, possible interference, change of particulars on the activation of voters in the system. IMBC's failure to set up access the certification and user activity review process. And IMBC was also arranged to have failed to respond to requests by auditors for crucial information. On the integrity of the technology deployed, it was the case for the seventh petitioner that in order to comply with Article 86 of the Constitution, and Section 44 of the Elections Act, the technology deployed must be simple, accurate, verifiable, secure, accountable, and transparent. On the simplicity of technology, the seventh petitioner contends that the Kim's kit failed the tests as they were not easily usable by ordinary citizens without expert knowledge. They further assert that IBC was expected to procure and put in place a technology necessary for the conduct of the general election at least 120 days before the election and ensure consultation with the relevant agencies, institutions, and stakeholders. Furthermore, the petitioners arranged that IMBC violated its constitutional duty by delegating the design, implementation, and conduct of the Kim's component of the election to a foreign company, Smartmatic International Holdings, BV. As a result, IMBC staff and the public did not have full comprehension of the Kim's component. They conclude, therefore, that IMBC abdicated and surrendered its role to conduct elections to Smartmatic, and that IMBC vigorously fought any attempt to subject Smartmatic's activities to accountability and transparency, including the safeguards required by Regulation 61, 69, 
and 75 of the elections, General Regulations 2012. In response, IBC has submitted that the electoral system met the constitutional threshold, that all the necessary information was accessed only by the authorized persons. The information was accurate, complete, and protected from malicious modification, either by authorized or unauthorized persons. IMBC maintained an audit trail on activities related to information, and that the information was available and could be authenticated through the use of various security features. In further response, IMBC contended that they engaged KPMG on 7th April 2022 to conduct an audit of the vote, register of voters, which was submitted on 18th June 2022. In addition, it issued a briefing on the report on 20th June 2022 summarizing the thematic areas they are in and disclosing its findings as well as actions taken to remedy the issues identified. It also conducted its annual audit in compliance with regulations 11 and 12 of the Election Technology Regulations 2017 and a certification of compliance issued to eight on 3rd August 2022. IMBC relied on sworn affidavits by Michael Uma, Moses Sunkuri, and Majan, Hussein Majan on 26th August 2022, which were to the effect that it published the interim report by KPMG on 8th June 2022 and embarked on remedial measures aimed at effecting the recommendations ahead of publication of the final report. It was asserted that it could not publish the full final audit report, as doing so would compromise the integrity and security of the electoral technology system, considering the provisions of the Data Protection Act which imposes a duty to protect the data of Kenyan voters. On the other hand, <coughs> the first and second respondents urge that even if there was failure of technology, it did not vitiate the result of the presidential election. Upon considering all the printing submissions and the ICT scrutiny and inspection tallying and recount report which fully examined the IMBC's result transmission system, RTS, we are not persuaded by the allegation that the technology deployed by IMBC failed the standard of Article 86A of the Constitution on integrity, verifiability, security, and transparency for the following reasons. One, whereas it is true that the Kim's kit failed in 235 polling stations, 86,889 voters were granted the right to vote manually, and the requisite forms 32A were duly filed. This happened successfully in Kibwesi West constituency and part of Kakamega County. Two, while the haunted report was released to the public seven days before the 9th August election, the register of voters was used at the election without any apparent anomalies. C three, Smartmatic, was procured to provide the necessary technological infrastructure as IMBC did not have the capacity to do so. No credible evidence meeting the requisite standard of proof of access to the system by unauthorized persons 
was adduced by the petitioners. The scrutiny report prepared by the registrar of this court did not reveal any security breaches of the IMBC's RTS. IMBC successfully deployed a biometric voter register system which captures unique features of a voter's facial image, fingerprints, and civil data to register and update voter details across the country and also in the diaspora. The BVL captures a voter's facial image, fingerprints, and civil data, which features are unique to each of the voter. In compliance with Section 6A of the Elections Act 2011, IMBC opened the register of voters for verification of biometric data by members of the public for a period of 30 days. Thereafter, the register was re revised to address issues arising from the verification exercise. KPMG then audited the register and we are satisfied that the inconsistencies and inaccuracies identified during the audit were somewhat successfully addressed. The second issue was whether there was interference with the hub rounding and transmission of Form 34A from the polling station to the IMBC public portal. The first petitioner arranged staging that a person who had access to the RTS intercepted, detained, or stored from 34A temporarily to convert or manipulate it before uploading it on IMBC's public portal. It is arranged also on 11 August 2022 IMBC dumped over 11,000 forms 34A on the public portal between 11 to 11.09 hours. To rebut this allegation, IMBC and its chairperson in their response dated 26th August 2022 denied staging and unauthorized intrusion of the RTS. In that regard, they urge that every image of Form 34A was uploaded immediately after the transmitter of results. The form was received as evidence by the timestamp. Similarly, the first respondent denied these allegations. Our finding, one, no credible evidence was presented to prove that anyone accessed the RTS to intercept, detain, or store forms 34A temporarily before they were uploaded to the public portal. The allegation that 11,000 forms 34A were effect affected by staging was similarly not proved. Two, the allegation that IMBC is officials and strangers used a tool to tamper with the forms 34A before converting them to the portable document format, that is PDF, that eventually appeared on the public photo was sufficiently explained when IMBC demonstrated how Kim's captured and transmitted the image of Form 34A. Accordingly, we dismiss that allegation. Three, during the ICT scrutiny, it turned out that the transmission logs produced in the affidavit of Justice Nyangaya were of no probative value. The registrar's report shows that the original forms 34A from the contestant polling stations, which were allegedly intercepted, were exactly the same as those on the public portal, 
and the certified copies that were presented to this court pursuant to the provisions of Section 12 of this uh, Supreme Court Act 2011. Four, regarding the allegation that the integrity of the public portal was compromised, this was disproved by evidence of consistent attributes such as unique timestamps, uniform PDF conversions at the polling stations, correct polling station mapping, and consistent KIMS reporting from verification to transmission of results. Six, the RTS was configured on a virtual platform network, VPN, and the SIM cards locked to a specific polling station. The server was also configured to accept results only from authorized and properly mapped KIMS kits. In our view, the petitioners failed to produce credible evidence to the contrary. Seven, a review of some of the logs presented as evidence of staging showed that they were either from logs arising from the 2017 presidential election or were outright forgeries. In our considered view, there was no evidence of a man in the middle server configured to the IBC's VPN network, and no evidence was produced to show that the chairperson of IBC and staff were part of the arranged conspiracy to stage the transmission process. Nine, whether there was a difference between Form 34A, a prudent on the IBC public portal, and the forms 34A received at the National Tiling Center, and forms 34A issued to the agents at the polling stations. On this issue, the first petitioner's case was that there was deliberate manipulation and tampering with the forms 34A, as demonstrated in the affidavits, to the effect that votes were being deducted from the first petitioner and being added to the first respondent. To support this petition, uh, evidence was contained in the affidavits of uh, Honorable uh, Martha Karua, sworn on 21st August 2022, Celestine Anyango Opio, uh, Arnold Ochieng Oginga, and John Mark Gidongo, which was sworn also on 21st August 2022, and a further affidavit sworn on Aga, 28th August 2022. Dr. Nyangasi also swore an affidavit on 21st August 2022, and so was Martin uh, Papa to support that allegation of handing and subtraction of votes. On the other hand, IBC and its chairperson urged that all forms 34A transmitted to IBC portal were not interfered with or manipulated. Further, that the forms 34A signed at the polling station and issued to the agents were identical to the forms 34A approved on the public portal and delivered to the National Tiling Center at the BOMAS. It was contended that in any event, IBC used the original physical forms 34A to tally, verify, and declare the presidential election results. This court ordered scrutiny of the forms from the 41 polling stations outlined in the affidavit of Celestine Opio to ascertain the allegation of interference. And this is our finding. One, there were no significant differences captured between the forms 34A approved on the public portal and the physical forms 34A delivered to bombers that would have affected the overall outcome of the presidential election. B, no credible evidence was presented to support the allegation 
that Form 34A presented to agents differed from those uploaded to the public portal. The report by the registrar of this court confirmed the authenticity of the original forms in the sampled polling stations. The affidavits of Celestine Opio and Arnold Ochieng Oginga, while containing sensational information, were not credible as the registrar's report confirmed that all the forms 34A attached to those affidavits and purportedly given to them by the agents at select polling stations were significantly different from the originals, certified copies, and those on the public portal. The purported evidence of uh, Celestine Opio and Arnold Oginga, sworn in their respective affidavits, are not only inadmissible, but are also unacceptable. It has been established that none of the agents on whose behalf the forms were being presented saw any affidavit, that there is nothing to show that they had instructed both Celestine and Arnold to act for them. Yet the two have gone ahead to depone on matters that are not within their knowledge. This court cannot countenance this type of conduct on the part of counsel who are officers of the court. Though it is elementary learning, it bears repeating that affidavits filed in court must deal only with facts which an opponent can prove of his own knowledge, and as a general rule, counsel are not permitted to swear affidavits on behalf of their clients in contentious matters like the one before us, because they run the risk of unknowingly swearing to falsehood and may also be liable to cross examination to prove the matters deponed. We must remind counsel who appear before this court or indeed before any other court or tribunal of the provisions of sections 113 and 114 of the penal code that swearing to false wounds is a criminal offense and two, that it is an offense to present misleading or fabricated evidence in any judicial proceeding. Section 114 of the Penal Code states, and I quote, any person who swears falsely or makes a false affirmation or declaration before any person authorized to administer an oath or a declaration upon a matter of public concern and at such circumstances that the false swearing or declaration if con committed in a judicial proceeding would have amounted to perjury is guilty of a misdemeanor. One of the most serious losses an advocate may ever suffer is the loss of trust by judges for a long time. Such conduct amounts to interference with the proper administration of justice. The contents of the affidavit of John Mark Gedongo, which may contain forgeries, are also dismissed for not meeting the evidential threshold. Those averments contain no more than incredible and hearsay evidence. No admissible evidence was presented to prove the allegation that Forms 34A were fraudulently altered by a group situated in Karen under the direction of persons named in the affidavit and video creep attached to it. As a matter of fact, these two affidavits amount to double hearsay and incapable of being proved at each of the rears. We turn to Form 34A for Gasharaigo Primary School, which was sensationally presented by Madam Juri Soweto Advocate to show that one Jose Kamango accessed the RTS and interfered with the result contained therein. This also turned out to be no more than hot air, and we were taken on a wild good chase that yielded nothing of probative value. The Kim's kit relating to 
Songonyo Primary School, which bore the same serial number with another, was admitted by IMBC as an inadvantaged manufacturer's error. We are also satisfied that the two kits <coughs> and other identifying features that were markedly different, including the timestamps and polling code, and therefore nothing turns on this anomaly. Therefore, to the question whether there was a difference between forms 34A uploaded on the IBC public portal and those received at the National Tiring Center and those issued to the candidates' agents at the polling station, we have found none. Issue number four, on whether the postponement of gubernatorial elections in Kakamega and Mombasa counties, parliamentary elections in Kitui, Rural, Kachiriba, Rongai, and Pokot South constituencies, and electoral wards in Yaki West, in North Menti constituency, and Kwanjenga in Embakasi South constituency, resulted in voter suppression to the detriment of the petitioners and especially in petition number five of 2022. It is common knowledge that IMBC postponed elections for various seats during the general elections of 9th August 2022 due to mix up of ballot papers in the above named electoral units. It is the combined case of the first and second petitioners that in terms of articles 136, uh, 2A, 177, 1, and 181 as read with article 1, 1 of the Constitution, the chairperson of IMBC and no jurisdiction to postone, postpone elections in those areas that section 55B of the Elections Act is inconsistent with the Constitution and therefore void to the extent that it purports to donate to IMBC power to postpone elections in the constituency, county, or ward, contrary to the Constitution and the postponement undermined the conduct of free, fair, credible elections by depriving the voters an opportunity to vote for all the candidates on the dates stipulated by the Constitution. The petitioners further contend that the postponement of elections and the overall effect of suppressing voter turnout in the electoral units in question, which was prejudicial to him. Both the first and third petitioners also believe that elections were deliberately postponed in Kakamega and Mombasa counties. It was arranged that these areas are considered to be first petitioner strongholds, and as such, the postponement of elections worked to its disadvantage and added that benefit to the second respondent. These assertions were denied by IMBC and its chairperson. They, however, admitted that they experienced confusion with the printed ballot papers and explained that they only discovered the mix-up on the eve of the election when the ballot papers were being distributed to the polling stations. That as a practice, ballot papers can only be opened on the eve of the election day to avoid any mischief and that by the time the mix-up was discovered, it was logistically impossible to print and replace the ballot papers in time for the elections. For this claim to succeed, it must be demonstrated first, IMBC and no authority in law to postpone the elections, and secondly, that the postponement was deliberate and calculated to suppress voter turnout so as to affect the results by reducing the petitioner's overall votes. We've looked at the provisions of Section 55B of the Elections Act, which provides for circumstances when elections can be postponed 
in a particular erect electoral unit, including in cases of emergency. We are therefore satisfied that on the basis of the foregoing provision, the third respondent and the requisite power to postpone erection in the constituencies, counties, and wards in question. Concerning the allegation of voter suppression, we note that voter suppression is generally recognized as a political strategy which takes many forms, but whose practical effect is ultimately to reduce voting by deliberately discouraging or preventing targeted groups of people from exercising their right to vote and thereby to influence the outcome of an election. It is therefore, it therefore goes against the letter and the spirit of Article 38, which guarantees every citizen the right to make political choices based on universal suffrage. As regards this allegation, it has not been shown that by postponing elections in the named electoral units, IMBC acted in bad faith or influenced or was influenced by irrelevant factors and considerations. From the explanation tendered, we are satisfied that the postponement was occasioned by a genuine mistake, which in our view could have been avoided and the members and staff of IMBC been more diligent when they went to inspect the templates in Athens, Greece, where the printing of ballot papers was undertaken. In the absence of any empirical data, we cannot find a basis upon which to conclude, as a matter of fact or evidence, that the postponement affected voter turnout as a consequence of which the first petitioner alone, as a presidential candidate, suffered disadvantage. At any rate, the nature of the ballot being an individual decision and secret, there may be other factors to which the turnout in the named units can be attributed. From the evidence on record, however, it appears to us that 2022 general election recorded one of the lowest turnouts since the introduction of multi-party political systems some 30 years ago. If there was a low voter turnout, it affected all the six categories of candidates, and its explanation, in our view, lies elsewhere, but certainly not a calculated suppression. On the other hand, in rebuttal to these claims, INBC illustrated with examples to our satisfaction that there was no nexus between the postponement of elections and voter turnout in the affected units, far from the fact that this claim was undoubtedly just another red hearing. It has nothing to do with the question under review, and accordingly we reject it and hold that there is no proof that the postponement resulted in voter suppression to the detriment of the first to the detriment of the first petitioner. Whether there were whether there were unexplainable discrepancies between the votes cast for presidential candidates and other elective positions. Issue number five. The first petitioner was categorical that there was systemic ballot staffing in certain counties, mainly in the Rift Valley and central parts of Kenya, where, according to him, a total of 33,000 Two eight votes were cast for president only without corresponding votes for the other elective positions. On the part of IMBC and the chairperson, while acknowledging that he did in some instances there was vote differential between those cast for president and for other positions, but maintained that they were insignificant, and those instances related to votes by prisoners and citizens in the diaspora 
who only vote for the president, but did not take part in other elective uh, positions. The differential also includes rejected ballot papers and three votes which do not count as valid votes. The well-established principle that the person who asserts a fact must prove it casts the burden upon the first petitioner to demonstrate that there were instances of ballot staffing of such a magnitude as to justify the nullification of the presidential election. Ballot staffing, which is an illegal addition of extra ballots, is a type of electoral fraud aimed at swinging the results of an election to one's a particular direction. Not a single document has been presented by the first petitioner to prove systemic ballot staffing. A figure of 33,208 votes relied on in this claim is based on unproven hypotheses that since the number of votes cast for the president is higher than those for other positions, then without more, it must follow that there was fraud. We find that fraud is a serious criminal offense and it must be proved beyond reasonable doubt under Section 5N of the Election Offenses Act. It is indeed an offense for a person to vote more than once in any election. IMBC has profound a plausible explanation for the vote differential, uh, citing categories of voters who only vote for the president, such as prisoners and Kenyans in the diaspora. There were an insignificant number of stray votes whose combined effect cannot justify nullification of the election. Finally, on this point, a general election in Kenya comprises of six different separate elections held concurrently on the same day. Such elections are held by secret ballots, and one cannot predetermine the voter turnout or how voters will vote in each election. None of the parties has flagged anything so significant that it would have affected the outcome of the presidential election vis-a-vis -vis the other five elections held on the same day. We find, therefore, there were no unexplainable discrepancies between the votes, votes cast for the presidential candidates and other elective positions. On issue number six, whether IMBC carried out the verification, tarring, and declaration of results in accordance with Article 138, 3C, and 138.10 of the Constitution. This issue arises from the printings in all the petitions as consolidated. Based on the said readings, the affidavits sworn in support thereof and the written and oral submissions by parties Two, two viewpoints regarding the meaning, scope, and application of Article 138, 3C, and 10 of the Constitution have been advanced. On the one hand, the petitioners submit that pursuant to the foregoing provisions, the role of verifying and tallying of votes as received from polling stations countrywide is vested in the commission as a corporate entity and not the chairperson of the commission. It is their argument that the chairperson cannot undertake this task to the exclusion of other commissioners. They submit that the language of Article 138.3c does not envisage a situation where the chairperson can arrogate to himself and fettered authority to verify and tally the results at the National Tallying Center without involving the other commissioners. Such action, they contend, would not only be unconstitutional, but would be sufficient ground without more to nullify an election of a president-elect. 
In support of their argument, the petitioner cites the Court of Appeal decision in IMBC versus Maina Kiai and five others as affirmed by this court in the case of Raira 2017. The petitioners further submit that Regulation 87.3 of the Erection General Regulations is unconstitutional to the extent that it purports to vest the power of verification and tallying in the chairperson of IMBC. On the other hand, the first, second, and third respondents submit that power to verify, tally, and declare results of a presidential election at the National Tallying Center is the exclusive preserve of the chairperson of IMBC. According to them, there is nothing unconstitutional about Regulation 87.3 of the Elections General Regulations. The same regulation the respondents submit makes no mention of commissioners other than the chairperson. At any rate, the respondents argue Article 138.3c of the Constitution does not envisage a situation where it is the commissioners who personally undertake the task of verifying and telling the results as entered into the thousands of forms 34A. Such an undertaking would be humanly impossible, they submit. For good measure, the respondents submit that Section 11A uh, of the IMBC Act provides that the chairperson and members of the commission are responsible for the formulation of policy and strategy of the commission and oversight. In their view, the act does not contemplate a situation where commissioners would be directly involved in the verification and tabulation of presidential election results. The task of verification and telling as stated by the respondent, is executed by the staff of the commission under the direction and supervision of the commission secretary, who in turn reports to the chairperson. As to whether the chairperson acted unilaterally in verifying and telling the presidential election results at the National Telling Center, the petitioners claim that he did, this is what happened. It is the petitioner's case that the chairperson published an illegal gazette notice number 4956 of 2022, in which he designated himself as the presidential returning officer, a position unknown in law and the constitution. Having done so, the petitioner states that the chairperson proceeded to conduct the verification and telling process to the exclusion of other commissioners, each of whom he assigned peripheral roles and related to the verification and tallying exercise. On his part, the chairperson of IBC submitted that although he has the exclusive authority to verify and tally the presidential election results as received at the National Tallying Center, he did involve the other commissioners in the exercise before eventually declaring the final results. He submitted that he did this in the spirit of teamwork. The chairperson of IBC states that indeed the four commissioners were involved in the preparation of the 9th August general elections from the time of their swearing into office all the way to the verification and tallying of results at the National Tallying Center until they withdrew from the exercise, just when he was set to declare the final result. Having considered all the parties' submissions, we find that pursuant to Article 138.3c of the Constitution, the power to verify and tally presidential election results as received at the National Tallying Center vests not in the chairperson of IMBC, but in the commission itself. The latter carries out this exercise through its sec secretariat staff, 
technical personnel and any other persons hired for that purpose under the oversight and supervision of the chairperson and the other members of the commission. In line with this court's decision in Raira Morondinga versus another, but, and another versus IMBC and two others, as reported in 2017, Kenya Law Report, uh, popularly known as Raira 2017, and the Court of Appeal decision in uh, IMBC versus Minor KI, we also find that the chairperson cannot arrogate to himself the power to verify and tally the results of a presidential election to the exclusion of other members of the commission. He did that Kuanda at 810 of the constitution, although the power to declare the results of a presidential election after verification and tally is vested in the chairperson, he does so only as a delegate of the commission. Consequently, to the extent that Regulation 873 of the Elections General Regulation purports to vest the power of verifying and tallying presidential election results as received at the National Tallying Center solely on the chairperson to the exclusion of other members of the commission, the same is contrary to and inconsistent with the provisions of the Constitution. That said, we however take cognizance of the fact that the fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh respondents are referred to as the four commissioners actively participated in the verification and tallying exercise from the beginning up to the, and until just before the declaration of the result uh, by the chairperson. They took turns announcing the results as verified and tallied and were present and active during the actual verification and tallying at BOMAS. An example is when one of them, Justice Nyangaya, stood on the podium to announce to the public results and also announced an adjustment that had been occasioned by errors of tabulation. The events of 15th August 2022, therefore, came as a surprise. As the public waited for the chairperson of IMBC to declare the final result, sporadic violence broke out at BOMAS. The violence swiftly contained, was contained by the security forces, but there was unexpected drama as two different factions of the commission began to emerge. Kenyans found themselves watching an appalling split screen scenario on their television sets. On one part of the screen was the chairperson reading himself to declare the results in accordance with Article 1810 of the Constitution. On the other part of the screen were the four commissioners on the rooms of the Serena Hotel, Nairobi from where they announced that they would not own the results that were soon to be declared by their chairperson. The four commissioners informed the public of their rejection of the yet to be announced results, terming them opaque due to the manner in which the chairperson had been conducting the verification and tarring exercise. In his affidavit dated 25th August 2022, just as Nyangaya avowed that the chairperson's actions during the tarring and verification exercise at BOMAS made it difficult to ascertain the total number of votes cast and the actual number of votes attained by each candidate so as to enable him authoritatively state the commission and declared accurate results. All the petitioners have anchored their arguments for the nullification of the 9th August presidential election in Taharia on the walkout from the bombers by the four commissioners. They contend that by rejecting IMBC's results on grounds of opaqueness of the verification and tallying process, they called into question the credibility 
of the entire election. They further submitted that being in the majority out of the seven member commission, their view should prevail and the election should be nullified. It is the petitioner's argument, therefore, that a dysfunctional commission cannot deliver a credible election. We note that apart from their 11th hour denunciation of the verification and tallying process and their averments regarding the conduct of the chairperson, the four commissioners have not placed before this court any information or documents showing that the elections were either compromised or that the result would have substantially differed from that declared by the chairperson. Critically, they have not explained why they participated in a verification process when they knew that it was opaque up until the last minute. Indeed, at the Serena Hotel press briefing, the four commissioners acknowledged that thus far the entire election had been managed efficiently and credibly. The chairperson on his part did not make matters any better by maintaining a stoic silence, even as things appeared to be falling apart. All this, in our view, points to a serious malaise in the governance of an institution entrusted with one of the monumental tasks of midwifing our democracy, an institution that obviously needs far-reaching reforms of which we shall say more in our detailed reasons. But are we to nullify an election on the basis of a last minute boardroom rupture, the details of which remain scanty and contradictory between the chairperson of the commission and some of its members? In the absence of any evidence of violation of the constitution and our electoral laws, how can we upset an election in which the people are participating without hindrance? As they made their political choices pursuant to Article 38 of the Constitution. To do this would be tantamount to subjecting the sovereign will of the Kenyan people to the quorum and ticks of IMBC. This we cannot do. Clearly, the current dysfunctionality at the Commission impugns the state of its corporate governance, but does not affect the conduct of the 2022 election. In view of the foregoing, we are satisfied that notwithstanding the divisions apparent between the chairperson and the four commissioners, IMBC carried out the verification Tarring and declaration of results in accordance with Article 138, 3C, and 10 of the Constitution. Issue number seven whether the declared President elect attained 50 plus one of all the votes cast in accordance with Article 138 of the Constitution. The first, second, and third petitioners averred that the first respondent did not garner 50% plus one of the total votes cast, and therefore did not meet the th threshold provided by Article 1.84a of the Constitution. They anchored their claims on the basis that in order to determine whether a candidate has attained 50% plus one, of the votes cast, this ought to be calculated based on the total number of votes cast, excluding rejected votes. They argued that 50% 50 of, of 14 million 353 and 165 votes, in their view, were the varied votes cast, which amounted to 7,176,582.77 votes. They therefore contended that by attaining 
7.176141 votes, the first respondent did not meet the constitutional threshold to be declared president elect. Supporting the claim that the first respondent did not meet the 50 plus one constitutional threshold was the sixth petitioner. His contention was founded on the backdrop of a press briefing issued by the chairperson of IMBC after the official closure of voting on 9th August 2022. According to the sixth petitioner, the, peer, the chairperson of IMBC announced that the voter turnout was 65.4% of the total number of registered votes based on the verification of the Kim's kits which were functional during the process of voting. In addition, the sixth petitioner urged that the voter turnout of 65.4% did not include some 238 polling stations where the Kim's kit and malfunctioned, necessitating use of the manual register. It was therefore urged that the minimum number of votes cast could not be less than 14,466,779. Additionally, that this number was bound to increase once the number of votes from the areas that use the manual register were included. The sixth petitioner further claimed that a summation of the minimum number of votes cast and untarried manual votes would represent the actual voter turnout. In challenging the declaration made by the chairperson of IMBC, the sixth petitioner warned that the final tally published in Form 34C only accounted for 14,326,641 votes cast, including some 113,614 rejected ballots. The sixth petitioner contended that this tally did not factor in some 140,138 votes cast using the manual register. The sixth petitioner computed this number by subtracting 14,326,641 declared votes cast from 14,466,779 generated by the sixth petitioner as representing 65.4% of the voter turnout. Referring to the tariffs in Form 34C, the sixth petitioner summed the number of votes cast for each candidate as follows. Raira Odinga, 6,942,193. William Ruto, 7,176,141. Wahiga Mwaura, 31,987. And George Wajakoya, 61,000. 969, adding to a total of 14,213,027. He then added 140,138,000 that arranged to be entered in the votes, and this yielded a total of 14,353,165 total varied votes, which the sixth petitioner used to compute the percentages garnered by each candidate as follows. Uh, William Ruto, according to him, garnered 49.9%, Daira Ondinga, 48.3%, Wahiga, 0.22%, and Wanjakoya, 0.3%. It is on this basis that the sixth petitioner grounded the claim that none of the candidates met the constitutional threshold as set out in Article 138.4a. IBC and its chairperson disputed the sixth petitioner's claim. <coughs> they submitted that the declaration of results is based on the number of people identified as having voted on the Kim's kit and not the total persons on the voters register as arranged. 
They contended that the final voter turnout comprising of the voters who were identified through the Kim's kit and those who voted manually was 64.76% and not 65.4% as arranged by the petitioners. They urged that the announcement error by the chairperson of IMBC on 10 August 2022 was immediately clarified during the same press briefing. And evidence of this correction was provided to this court in an affidavit of the first and second respondents in presidential election petition number seven of 2022. According to IMBC and the chairperson, 14,239,862 voters were identified using the Kim's kit, while 86,889 voters were identified using the printed voter register. Therefore, the total valid votes cast were 14,213,137 while the total number of rejected ballots were 113,614, constituting 14,326,751 total votes cast. They illustrated that the first respondent garnered 7.176,141 votes against 14,213,137 total valid votes cast yielding a percentage of 50.49 to meet the requisite constitutional threshold for a candidate to be declared president-elect. In the upshot, the, the percentage attained by each candidate was as follows. Raira Odinga, 48.84%, William Ruto, 50.48%, Waiga Maure, 0.22%, and John Juanjakoya, 0.43%. INBC and its chairperson also submitted that the Kim's kits malfunctioned in 235 polling stations, necessitating the use of the print, printed voter register. In these polling stations, Backup Kim's kits were later deployed for purposes of results transmission. The first respondent in response to the question of 50 plus one constitutional threshold maintained that he attained the threshold under Article 1384 of the Constitution as elaborated by the IMBC and the chairperson. This court has considered the differing formulas and the threshold arguments presented by various parties to this petition, while the first, second, and third petition has raised pertinent questions connected to this issue, we shall address them together with those of the sixth petitioner who has addressed and focused on the issue as specifically framed in detail. It must be restated that the case made by the sixth petitioners concerns a data-specific threshold as enunciated under Article 1384 of the Constitution that without attainment of which there can be no declaration. This data-specific threshold is what this court declared in John Arun Mwau and two others versus IBC and others. Uh, petitions numbers two and four of 2017 consolidated, defined to as the ultimate yardstick for determining the winner in a presidential context. In Raira Odinga and five others versus IBC, petition number five, three, and four of 2013, mm -hmm. this court asserted that rejected ballot papers do not constitute a vote cast to be included in calculating the final tally in favor of a presidential candidate. We are not persuaded by Amicus Curie's brief, that is Raw Society, who attempted to persuade us to consider our position on this finding. 
We reiterate that rejected votes cannot be taken into account when calculating whether a presidential candidate attained 50% plus, 50 plus one of the votes, votes cast in accordance with Article 134 of the Constitution. Similarly, in the same Raida 20. And this is what the court said, I quote, in the case of data-specific electoral requirements such as those specified in Article 138 4 of the Constitution, for an outright win in the presidential election, the party bearing the legal burden of proof must rechange it beyond any reasonable doubt. The question that follows was whether the petitioners challenging the attainment of 50% plus one constitutional threshold and the computation by the sixth petitioner in general met the standard of proof settled by this court in Laira 2013 case. The premise of the sixth petitioner's percentage computation was a press briefing made by the chairperson of IBC on 10th August 2022 when the evidential burden shifted to IBC and its chairperson, as it does in election cases, they produced video evidence correcting the percentage voter turnout to read 64.6 at the time of the briefing. This percentage, however, did not include reports from all the Kim's kids and 86,889 votes voters who are identified manually using the printed register of voters. In our view, the assertion by the sixth petitioner that the percentage voter turnout was firstly predicated on the uncollected percentage given by the chairperson of IBC was negated by evidence and used to prove the correction. Secondly, the sixth petitioner based his percentage on, of voter turnout on the total number of registered voters while the chairperson of IBC made reference in the press briefing to the number of registered voters who were identified through the Kim's kids progressively. The sixth petitioner also asserted that rounding off of votes cast in a presidential election as a means of assessing the threshold under Article 1384 of the Constitution, kills and bads voters, which is illegal and unconstitutional. We have deliberated on this proposition and found that it is not mathematically sound and that the rounding off done by IBC and the chairperson was correct. Consequently, we find that the petitioners did not provide a watertight case to warrant the setting aside of the results of the presidential election on the basis of not having met the threshold provided under Article 1384A of the Constitution. On the voter turnout, therefore, we find that the formula predicated on the number of voters identified through Kim's kit progressively and used by IBC and the chairperson to generate a percentage of 64.76% was correct. Having settled the issue of voter turnout, we must ask ourselves whether in the making of the declaration, the chairperson of IBC applied the formula in Article 1384 of the Constitution, which is total number total votes cast, less rejected votes, divide by two, must always give 50% plus one vote. Given the numbers that were presented to us by IBC and the chairperson, this will translate to 14 million, 213, 137, divide by two, plus one, which makes 
the question that must inevitably follow is whether this formula, when applied, will confirm that 7,106,569 votes is less than 7.176,141, which represents the number of votes received by the first respondent. We find that it is, as such, on the basis of the foregoing formula and from the numbers provided by IBC and the chairperson and the declaration by the chairperson of the president-elect on 15 August 2022, it is our finding that the declared president-elect attained 50% plus one of all the votes cast in accordance with Article 1384 of the Constitution. Issue number eight, on whether there were irregularities and illegalities of such magnitude as to affect the final result of the presidential election. Although the petitioners have provided numerous averments pointing to possible irregularities and illegalities marked by failure of technology, arranged voter suppression, printing and utilization of book two of two, EO preparation by the IMBC and its chairperson, commission indiscretions, transposition anomalies, agent absence, and many others, we are of the view that the pointed illegalities and irregularities were not of such magnitude as to affect the final result of the presidential election. We will delve deeper into the details of this uh, issue in our reasoned judgments. Last issue, what reliefs and orders can the court grant? Under Article 163.3 of the Constitution, it is provided that the Supreme Court will have a exclusive original jurisdiction to hear and determine disputes relating to the election of the office of the president arising under Article 40, 140. And Article 140 provides, I quote, a person may file a petition in the Supreme Court to challenge the election of the president-elect within seven days after the date of the declaration of the results of the presidential election. Two, within 14 days after the filing of a petition under Cross 1, the Supreme Court shall hear and determine the petition and its decision shall be final. If the Supreme Court determines the election of the president elect to be invalid, a fresh election shall be held within 60 days after the determination. In exercising its jurisdiction pursuant to these provisions, the court sits as an election court with a mandate to determine the validity or otherwise of the election of the president-elect. It is clear to us that the jurisdiction of the court is quite circumscribed in terms of the orders, all leaves it can grant following the hearing and determination of the election petition under Article 140 of the Constitution. In the event the court determines that the election of the president-elect is invalid, it must make an order nullifying the election. Consequently, it has also to make an order directing IMBC to hold a fresh election within 60 days after the determination. Should the court determine that the election of the president-elect is valid, it shall issue a declaration to that effect. The court has then, as a matter of course, to make an order dismissing the petition with or without cost, as the case may be. In the strict sense, therefore, these are the only orders that the court may make under the Constitution. The court cannot assume jurisdiction that goes beyond the purview of Articles 163.3 and 140 of the Constitution. However, nothing stops the court from issuing orders or leaves by way of recommendations. Indeed, since 20, 2013, this court has issued many recommendations arising from the determination of three petitions 
challenging the election of the president-elect. The recommendations are meant to improve our electoral landscape and ends end in the development of our democracy. In this regard, this court has been greatly ended by the contributions also of the Amici uh, Curie. And the court places a heavy premium on those briefs that were filed and those which were admitted. Uh, the final orders made by the courts. This is a unanimous decision of the court, and we make the following orders. One, the presidential election petition number E005 of 2022 as consolidated with the presidential election petition numbers E001, 2, 3, 4, 7, and 8 of 2022 are hereby dismissed. As a consequence, we declare the election of the first respondent as president-elect to be varied under Article 143 of the Constitution. This being a matter cutting across the public interest, we order that each party do bear their own costs. It is so ordered. And finally, the court has asked me to also acknowledge, although we'll do it in the long draft, the enormous contribution made by council uh, in these uh, proceedings um, and also the only way the council or the advocates and parties conducted themselves they remained seated throughout the proceedings um, that is the judgment of the court a unanimous one uh, we shall issue a media summary to help the media summarize the case. I think that is all. Thank you very much for coming. My lady, Madam Chief Justice, and the learned judges of this court, again, it, I am requested by my colleagues to thank you most profusely for your labors in delivering this judgment, listening to all of us, and giving our nation uh, this judgment so that we may move forward. Thank you, and God bless you. It may please the court. It is not true that I asked the Attorney General <laughs> Emeritus to talk on our behalf. Uh, uh, next time, you, you should. Uh, it should be a, should talk to me. <laughs> Let me similarly, on behalf of the lawyers for the counsel for the first and second petitioner, thank the court. Uh, and uh, it has been a, a journey, a worthwhile journey, sitting through these proceedings. And we thank the court for your patience and for the delivery of this judgment within the time stipulated. We thank you. Madam President, members of the court, I wish to request just a couple of minutes for the chairperson of the Law Society of Kenya to make a few remarks in appreciation of the work that the court and Kenyans have done on this exercise, if you allow. Thank you. I call upon Mr. Eric Theuri to come and make his remarks. It is also his birthday. I would have, I would have sung happy birthday for him. Um, hello, the Chief Justice of uh, the Republic of Kenya, the President of the Supreme Court, mm -hmm. the Deputy Chief Justice and all the Justices of the Supreme Court. I think it would only be fair that I make my remarks after 
counsel for the respondents, uh, Senior Fred Ngatia, makes his uh, remarks to the court. Uh, Madam Chief Justice, thank you very much. It's so kind for the President to acknowledge that age goes before youth. Mine is to thank the court, to thank my learned friends for the effort we all expended. We thank this court for clarifying certain issues, and we look forward to a less corrosive 2027. Thank you very much. Madam Chief Justice, Madam Deputy Chief Justice, it's so nice to have two madams at the same time and members of the court. Since there are only men talking, I decided that I should become a woman and talk. It's, it's become too much of a male affair in here. But on behalf of the, well, I think we were the third petitioner, I, we wished, I wish to thank you and clar you've clarified the regulation 87.4, which I was feeling very passionately about that it was unconstitutional from what I've heard. But thank you very much for the time you spent. And we do apologize if at times we looked like hooligans. I mean, you have said we behaved well, but we didn't behave as well as we should have. But thank you very much for your time and for delivering this judgment. I'm Chief Justice. Madam Deputy Chief Justice, members of the court, I, on behalf of Attorney General, take this opportunity to thank you most sincerely for a great job done and for the courage to clearly define the limits of the law, which will help us empower IBC on the way forward and hope that uh, this might be the last of the petitions after elections once we carry out a proper election based on your guidelines. Thank you. The Chief Justice and uh, the Justices of uh, the Supreme Court, on a light note, uh, my members would be extremely worried if uh, we take the submissions of senior counsel or angle that this should be the end on account of fees. <laughs> but Baleli, uh, the Chief Justice, on behalf of the Law Society and all the members of uh, the Society, we wish to first of all take this opportunity to thank the court in the manner in which it has conducted these proceedings, extremely efficient, especially in light of uh, the really short and strict timelines that you've had. But uh, the management of the proceedings, the manner in which the court adopted a somewhat inquisitorial nature to the conduct of these proceedings is something that as a society we have noted and we wish to commend the court and we do hope that uh, the other courts as they determine any petitions, election petitions that will go before them will similarly adopt such inquisitorial uh, uh, attitude so that uh, we try and uh, really enrich uh, the process that uh, these proceedings intend to achieve. Secondly, I wish to also thank the council, all the advocates who have appeared before you. They have uh, demonstrated extremely high standards of decorum and courtesy, and have also demonstrated a flair for persuasion of the court, including the use of PowerPoints, and of course the now famous pinky pinky ponky mimic. But all that really, I'm sure, has uh, demonstrated, especially to the younger members of the society, how to conduct themselves before the court and how to really prepare 
a persuasive brief and we thank all the advocates who appeared before this court for the good work that they have done. And of course, as a society, we feel extremely proud that they have been able to raise the profile of the advocates in this country a notch higher from their presentation. So my lady and my, and my lord, it's not lost to us that at the end of these proceedings and once we are able to get your judgment after 21 days, that it is democracy and the Kenyan people who are the winners. The decision today, in a way, validates the choices that were made by the Kenyan people on the, 20, on the 8th of August, and they also help to build confidence in the institutions that manage the elections and the court. We recognize that no country is born as a democracy and that it is a process and the process of challenging an election as has happened before this court is part of the processes of building confidence within the electoral system and we thank all the petitioners for choosing to challenge the results before this court but at the end of the day uh, Kenya stands tall as a beacon of democracy and we are very grateful that we've had this opportunity also as a law society to appear before the court and to give an amicus brief which the court has had time to consider. So we thank you and we wish you a good day. I know it has been a long 14 days but you can, uh, can rest and we'll be looking forward to the decision that you deliver within 21 days. Thank you so much, my lady and justices of the Supreme Court. Um, thank you, Mr. President. I have been asked by the president of our court to react to your submissions. And in so doing, I I'm obliged to say that we are truly humbled by the statements that you have just made. More humbled because those statements come from both sides of the divide. And thank you for appreciating what we have to do within a very short while. Thank you for appreciating that it wasn't our wish that we were doing what we were doing. We were doing the wish of the Constitution of Kenya 2010, the laws of the Republic, the facts of the cases that you placed before us, and the evidence in the rebuttal. We know that, uh, and we have repeatedly said this, the President and I, whenever we have had time to talk to you in other fora, that we are incomplete without this side of the bar. We are incomplete without the advocates. We thank you. We will get opportunity to do that in the main judgment, in the reasoned judgment. But we really appreciate your industry we were impressed by the submissions you took. And we were impressed, and we said this the last three days, I'll tell you something about that in a minute, by how deeply you believed in your clients' cases. That we think is a mark of an extremely grown legal profession, and we ask that you do not, you do not, bring the bar down. You keep taking it up. In any contest of whatever nature, and even if we say there are no winners and losers, and even if we say that the winners are the Constitution and the people of Kenya, the truth is that uh, 
some six million Kenyans will not be happy today. But that's the nature of the work we do. What we hope and we hope you can advise your clients and our brothers and sisters that are the Kenyan people that that is what was expected. One side had to, to win, one side had to be in total or a great extent of compliance with the constitution and electoral law than the other side. That's how we saw it. We thank you very much. We, the seven of us, have not slept since we parted company on Friday. I think it is showing on our faces. Um, and we, we thank you that you appreciate that um, we work under difficult circumstances, especially because of time. As ground rules, we agreed when we left you here on Friday that we would not pick any of your course. A lot of you called us, but we just couldn't pick your course. And I hope you understand that we couldn't. Um, we, we saw that you were trying to call us, but we just could not pick the course. I hope you understand. Um, and now if you allow us again, on behalf of these seven men and women, Thank you very much for appreciating what we have to do. Thank you for giving us the honor to serve this country in these capacities. And let's hope that we can continue to grow our democracy this way. And thank you very much for everything you also do for the country. And now you allow us to go home and sleep. Thank you. The court is adjourned. Yeah. Tons, tons of wisdom.